Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Taylor Smithhams, and I'm an organizer with 350's US team. We are really excited to dig into a vital conversation about militarism, war, and the climate crisis with an incredible group of speakers. As most of you know, 350.org is a global climate advocacy organization dedicated to ending our dependence on fossil fuels by ushering in a fast and just transition to renewable energy. As we start 2024 with multiple wars raging around the world, we want to create space to highlight how militarism and war are key drivers of the climate crisis. Sprawling militaries like the US's massive network of bases around the world are enormous sources of emissions. War reduces international cooperation and takes away resources from vital investments like climate finance as countries double down on military spending. In short, militarism is antithetical to building a just and, coll and collective transition away from fossil fuels and toward a sustainable future. Yet, militarism is too often left out of our conversations and organizing within the climate movement. Today, we'll hear from an exciting lineup of speakers who will talk about the connections between militarism and the climate crisis from their own perspectives, draw connections between our struggles, and reflect on the critical role that we as climate activists play in ensuring that our collective resources are directed at nurturing life and freedom for all. Before we get started, we want to do a little grounding to center ourselves in the why we do this work. Don't forget to take a deep breath. And if you are feeling distracted, that's okay. Just try to gently nudge yourself back to this space. As we learn more about militarism and climate change, we felt it was important to show a short video of a dear comrade of many of ours, Berta Caceres. Berta was an indigenous Lenca organizer, mother, and water defender from Honduras. After the US supported coup in that country in 2009, Honduras was opened up even further to corporate plunder. And Berta and her community resisted the building of a dam on the Guacarque River, a river sacred to the Lenca people. For this work, she was assassinated in her home on March 3, 2016. The video clip we will show you is Berta's call to us all, just one year prior to her assassination, as she received the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2015. The video is in Spanish with English subtitles. Gracias. Buenas noches. Gracias a la familia Goldman. En nuestras cosmovisiones somos seres surgidos de la tierra, el agua y el maíz. De los ríos somos custodios ancestrales del pueblo lenca, resguardados además por los espíritus de las niñas, que nos enseñan que dar la vida de múltiples formas por la defensa de los ríos es dar la vida para el bien de la humanidad y de este planeta. El Copín, caminando con pueblos por su emancipación, ratifica el compromiso de seguir defendiendo el agua, los ríos y nuestros bienes comunes y de la naturaleza, así como nuestros derechos como pueblos. Despertemos, despertemos humanidad, ya no hay tiempo. Nuestras conciencias... Nuestras conciencias serán sacudidas por el hecho de estar solo contemplando la autodestrucción basada en la depredación capitalista, racista y patriarcal. El río Hualcarque nos ha llamado así como los demás que están seriamente amenazados en todo el mundo. Debemos sacudir. La madre tierra militarizada, cercada, envenenada, donde se violan sistemáticamente derechos elementales, nos exige actuar. Construyamos entonces sociedades capaces de ocupar 
coexistir de manera justa, digna y por la vida. Juntémonos y sigamos con esperanza defendiendo y cuidando la sangre de la tierra y de sus espíritus. Dedico este premio a todas las rebeldías, a mi madre, al pueblo lenca, a Río Blanco, al Copín, a las y los mártires por la defensa de los bienes de la naturaleza. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Now I want to introduce our moderator for today, Darna Noor. Darna is a fossil fuels and climate reporter at The Guardian. She was previously climate producer and reporter at the Boston Globe. Earlier, she worked as a staff writer at Gizmodo's climate vertical Earther, where she also co-produced a season of the podcast Drilled about the fossil fuel industry's influence on education. And before that, she led the climate team at the Real News Network. Her writing has also appeared in publications, including In These Times, Jacobin Magazine, and Truth Out, and was also featured in two books, The World We Need and Future on Fire. Welcome, Darna. Thanks so much, Taylor, for that very kind introduction. I'm so honored to be here today with this esteemed panel to talk about something that I agree with you, Taylor, we don't hear enough about in the climate space, uh, militarism. The US military, we know, uses more fossil fuel than any other institution on Earth. And as our first panelist found in a groundbreaking study in 2019, it's also the single largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. And it's not just the US. The world's militaries produce at least 5.5% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than the total footprint of Japan, according to one 2022 estimate. Despite this, the terms war and military often go unmentioned in the climate conversation, including in international climate negotiations, even though militarism underpins the entire fossil fuel economy. And even though militaries are often sources of extreme environmental injustice, something we'll surely hear more about today. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker today. Dr. Nita Crawford is the Montague Burton Professor of International Relations at Oxford University. She also co-directs the Costs of War Project based at Brown University. Her most recent book, The Pentagon, Climate Change and War, won the American Book Award in 2023. Uh, and Nita is also a member of both the British Academy and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I'll mention too that Dr. Crawford's work really helped open my eyes to the massive role of the US military in the climate crisis. So thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Darna, and also Taylor, as well as um, the organizers, all the organizers. Uh, 350's work has been really important for understanding uh, and acting for many people, so I'm glad to be here. Okay, so I have just 10 minutes and I'm going to talk fast. Let me know if you can't interpret the speed at which I go. Okay, so the dominant narrative in understanding climate change is that industrialization, the industrial revolution and industrial agriculture led to increases in greenhouse gas emissions. But I want to suggest that um, that's sort of, yes, that's true, but there's more to it if we look at the role of the United States military and other militaries in industrialization. And then secondly, the another dominant narrative is that climate change leads to conflict. So I'm going to make about six arguments today in very rapid succession. The first one I think is the most important that war and military industrialization have been significant contributors to global warming. And uh, they contribute to global warming in several ways. First, the direct emissions from operations, including war. Secondly, uh, from training and uh, from installations. And then there's the indirect contribution of purchased energy for bases and installations. And then there's military industrialization, which if you look at the US military's emissions, you double that and you have the entire picture because military industrial emissions are about the same size in any one year in the US as military emissions. 
So that's uh, the indirect way, but, but there's another indirect way, which is that uh, military activity shapes an economy. And it shapes the economy through mobilization of society in hot wars and cold wars. And in particular, this mobilization shapes not just the pace and the scale of activity, but the kind of activity. So I'll just give you one example. In the Cold War, the United States uh, in 1954, 55, decided it would have an interstate highway system. The interstate highway system was meant to do two things. One, facilitate the transportation of fuel and goods during a wartime mobilization across the United States from the industrial heartland out to the coasts. And then secondly, to facilitate the exiting of mass numbers of people in case of nuclear war. So those people would be escaping the inner cities and moving out to the suburbs or hinterlands to uh, escape any Soviet weapons which would come their way. Now, of course, this fosters a certain kind of uh, suburbanization and economic development in the United States as just one example of the way that war has shaped our environment and the, or the anticipation of war in this case. So another way that uh, war affects emissions is, of course, the destruction of urban centers, but also the deliberate and inadvertent destruction of farmland and of forests and of wetlands. And that kind of destruction, of course, uh, reduces the capacity for sequestration. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, indirect wartime emissions is the way that when a society is utterly destroyed, it can be rebuilt in a number of ways. And most of the ways that are rebuilt are very carbon intensive. And so with nearly 40 to 50 percent of Gaza being destroyed, it will be rebuilt. Ukraine will be rebuilt. The question is, will it be rebuilt in a green way or the sort of usual standard way? which is fairly carbon intensive, including cement production. Okay, that was the first thing I want to talk about, the ways that war and military mobilization, industrialization have uh, played into increasing emissions. The second thing I want to talk about is the increased uh, or the emissions of particular militaries. And I'll focus on the United States. That's the country I know the best. As was already mentioned, uh, the U.S. is the single largest, the U.S. DOD is the single largest energy user in the U.S. And its military emissions as an institution are the single largest of any institutional emitter besides countries. So if you compare the United States emissions in 2022 from the military, uh, they are larger than many countries emissions added especially the poorer countries, which don't have uh, significant emissions of greenhouse gases, and they're comparable to Sweden's in, in that year, the entire country of Sweden's emissions or Portugal. So uh, the emissions are significant as part of the United States economy. It's about 1% of the U.S. economy for military emissions, but when you add the uh, military industrial emissions, it moves up to a little bit more than uh, two and a half percent, nearly three percent of total emissions of the United States. So now to understand this historically, what I think it's important to do that, uh, you need to think about the ways that the emissions track military activity. So U.S. military emissions track war, Cold War, mobilization and the scale, the overall size of the standing military. So the number of bases and the kinds of activities that are uh, our US military is engaged in. So the average annual emissions from 1975 to 1991 were 103 million metric tons CO2 equivalent. In the period from 1992 to 2000, that is just before the uh, post 
the, the 9-11 attacks, uh, they were 75 million metric ton CO2 equivalent. And then following the 9-11 attacks until 2022, they're uh, averaging 70 million metric ton CO2 equivalent. So there were some peaks there though. In 1975, near the end of the Vietnam War, it was 109 million metric tons. In 1991, it was uh, during the Gulf War, it was 110 million metric tons. And then during the peak of activity, military activity during the post 9-11 wars, it was 85 million metric tons CO2 equivalent. Now, you've noticed, if you're following what I'm saying, that emissions have declined. The question is why? And they have declined with a transition that many economies have made from coal. So the US military is still the only part of the US government that's burning coal. Um, but, but the overall transition away from coal is important in the understanding that story. The United States also transitioned to all of its submarines and aircraft carriers being nuclear powered. And then it decreased following the Cold War, the number of bases, they went from about 2000 overseas bases to 1000 or so, and now we're about 750 overseas bases. Now you, you could ask yourself, well, is renewable energy part of the story? And really it's only responsible for about 1% of the reduction that I'm describing. Uh, so the services, each of them, proposes to cut their emissions, and they have uh, emission reduction goals that were recently articulated to 2021. So for example, the Army has said it will reduce its emissions by 50% in uh, by 2020, I'm sorry, 2030. And this is from a 2005 baseline. In their document, though, they don't say what their baseline number of Em emissions was, but I do know that they've already reduced about 42% between 2010 and 2019. So that what I'm saying is that emission reduction goal is not ambitious. They're almost already there if, if they've not already met it. The Navy and the Air Force also have emission reduction uh, goals, which I could talk about um, later in Q&A if you're interested. But keep in mind that the Air Force is, among all the services, the largest emitter because aircraft are very thirsty and highly uh, emitting of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Okay, now the third point. The DOD assumes that conflict will increase as climate change uh, wreaks havoc on our lives. They like the National Security Council, suggest three things. One, that there'll be increasing geopolitical tension in general. Secondly, that there'll be unilateral efforts to deploy geoengineering, which could be destabilizing. And then thirdly, that uh, there'll be increased tension at borders as nations take steps to secure their interests and resources. And they're also anticipating a huge flow of migrants to the United States and these uh, economic migrants or climate change migrants will take stuff away from Americans who are already there. So then they also talk about two other sort of regions of instability. One is Central Africa. And of course, you know, Central Africa has not contributed the most greenhouse gases, but they are very vulnerable. And uh, also the uh, island nations that are vulnerable to sea level rise. Okay, so they see climate change as causing instability and war. And uh, at one event where I was in Dubai recently, they said, uh, the DOD just said, just we're just gonna take that for granted. And then we're gonna talk from there. Okay, but fourth point, conflict is not necessarily a result of climate change. Increasing tension is not necessarily a consequences of, of uh, immiseration. What we could see is responses to climate change, which are dependent on governmental capacity, aid, trade agreements, and diplomatic activity. Conflict does not necessarily come to a neighborhood near you because global warming is coming to a neighborhood near you. Okay, fifth point. There is room for military emissions reductions. Okay, I described these goals um, and they tell you that they're ambitious, but they aren't. There's 
a lot of room to reduce military emissions, not just for the United States, but for other countries. And this can be done um, by, for instance, doing another round of base realignment and closure, which would uh, address what the DOD itself says is a 20% or so excess capacity that they have at their bases. And um, you could also rethink the existing installa installations and missions overseas and spend less um, effort, for instance, patrolling the Persian Gulf as we use less oil from the Persian Gulf. Need and hot time if you could wrap it up quickly. Please. Last point. Um, fifth point, final point, is we don't need to ask the DOD to lead the energy transition. Okay, it's too inefficient to ask them uh, to do that. We have everything we need in the civilian sector for um, making the energy transition. Thank you. Well, thank you so much and uh, definitely looking forward to hearing more from Nita um, in our Q&A portion. Um, but second, I, I wanna introduce our next speaker, uh, Zaki Mamdu, who is an organizer, campaigner, uh, an activism and human rights coordinator from Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. He currently serves as the coordinator of the Stop ECOP campaign uh, and is involved in numerous other social and climate justice campaigns, organizations, and movements. Thanks again for being with us today. Thanks so much, Tana. And let me also just thank the 350 US team for putting together this incredibly important discussion, which I think is coming at a, a critical moment for the climate justice movement as we begin and, and continue to explore these issues and uh, root them in our collective struggle for climate justice. So I hope to think, uh, well, I hope my contributions would add some value to this to this conversation um, and, and to build on, on, on some of what a lot of the other speakers I'm sure will speak to and what uh, Dr. Nita has already, you know, begun delving into. Um, and I think, look, for me, uh, what I'd like to see is uh, an attempt to try and understand the, the very real implications of war and, and militarism on climate, as well as the, the ways in which militarism, uh, conflict and conquest are situated at the very core of the crisis of climate collapse that we find ourselves in. Um, and I think uh, in order to do this, uh, we must turn our gaze to the, the colonial and post-colonial world. Um, and here we must assess the deliberate undoing of the natural world alongside the kind of primitive accumulation and brutality, uh, which has ushered in the, the capitalocene, as it were. And capitalocene is a, is a term which sets itself apart from the one that is commonly used, the Anthropocene, which... Uh, blames the, the the climate crisis on human activity generally, whereas the capitalist scene asserts the fact that this is an era in which advanced capitalism in its current form uh, both produces and reproduces the conditions and the modes of production uh, which threaten the existence of, of life uh, on this planet in itself. Um, now, as the last remaining project of European settler colonialism and as the front on which... Um, Western imperialism and US imperialism in particular is showing its ugly teeth in this current moment. I think it is fitting that we begin this discussion with our gaze locked uh, on Gaza and the rest of occupied Palestine. Um, we have seen the nightmarish brutality of Israel's medieval siege on Gaza involving, you know, relentless bombing of the Strip, as well as um, blocking access to food, water, fuel, uh, medical supplies, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, the article that came out in The Guardian yesterday references a study which holds that uh, in the first 60 days um, of the siege alone, the occupation forces have emitted over 281,000 metric tons of carbon, uh, which is already far higher than the annual emissions of, of many countries in the global south. Um, and of course, and it's... And it's um, stated quite plainly in the article itself that this is a conservative underestimation and does not account for the emissions of the entire industrial um, and, and supply chain which feeds the Israeli death machine. Um, so of course uh, 
Some experts place the estimations far higher. I saw one analyst had estimated that the occupation forces have emitted over 1.2 million uh, metric tons of CO2, uh, which means that in less than 100 days, the Israeli military has released more CO2 than the entire global fashion industry does in the space of a year. Um, now, beyond the emissions of the military apparatus and machinery itself, the actual bombing and destruction of infrastructure coupled with the ground invasion and displacement of about 85% of the population in Gaza has, has resulted in the complete disruption of normal life. And in turn, this has led to the collapse of waste management systems, including you know, water treatment, water pumps, uh, sanitation, desalination facilities. Um, it's resulted in sewage flowing through the streets, seeping into the land, flowing into the seas, um, you know, spreading waterborne illnesses like typhoid, cholera, uh, hepatitis, um, and while obviously having a devastating impact on uh, ocean ecosystems. Um, now, added to this, of course, is the destruction of tens of thousands of buildings in Gaza, uh, with the strip leveled almost entirely to a landscape of, of debris. Uh, now, this, alongside the usage of chemical weapons such as white phosphorus, has been incredibly polluting to both the air and water and has created a toxic environment uh, that all Gazans are unavoidably exposed to, as, as you know, all people have to breathe. Um, now, even before this, this current escalation uh, in this moment since, since the offensive on October 7th, um, and in fact, it's been reported that since uh, 1967, the Israeli occupation forces and settler militias have illegally uprooted more than 800,000 olive trees uh, across occupied Palestinian territories. Now, these olive trees are not only a sacred part of land stewardship practices, um, but are also a vital carbon sink. Each olive tree plays a role in absorbing CO2, in uh, preventing soil erosion, and of course, in bolstering uh, food security. Uh, so this sort of damage to Palestinian land is then also further compounded by Israeli bans on imports of things like steel pipes, uh, which of course are, are vital for uh, wastewater treatment. Um, and the lack of this, this kind of uh, infrastructure has meant that huge amounts of sewage uh, you know, have, have been seeping into the Mediterranean Sea for, for many years already. Um, so I think, look, there's, there's many more examples that can be drawn out here. But the point that I want to get to um, is that if you look at occupied Palestine, uh, what you find is an environmental crisis that has been deliberately manufactured by the machinery of war. And you have a people who find themselves incredibly vulnerable to the worsening crisis of, uh, of climate precisely because of the war that Israel has waged on them. Um, and their ability to mitigate and, and to develop mechanisms to offset the worst impacts of the climate crisis, of, crisis rather, have, have also been completely and deliberately undermined, while the resources and infrastructure they would need to meet the crisis have in very real terms uh, either been destroyed or stolen. Um, and this is as part of a, a calculated and deliberate attempt to wipe the Palestinian people their, their culture, their knowledge, their land, uh, and their history off the map entirely. Um, so to emphasize here, um, they have not aimlessly wandered and found themselves by some uh, act of random chance, um, you know, to be in what we would call, as people within the climate justice space, what we would call frontline communities. Uh, they are not simply living as vulnerable people who stand to face the worst impacts of the climate crisis, uh, just because they happen to be on the front lines. No, the, the front lines themselves have been manufactured. The Palestinian people have been made to live in it. Um, it has been imposed onto them by their oppressor. Now, I think this is an important distinction for us to make when we draw out the links between war, uh, imperialism, conflict, uh, and conquest, and the realities of climate collapse. Uh, because in many ways, what we have described in Palestine is also the reality in the broader uh, post-colonial world. Uh, we often talk about how the climate crisis stands to impact the poorest, the most vulnerable, and, and most marginalized members of our global society. And of course, specifically those in the global south and in diaspora communities. Uh, but 
what we must never fail to forget in this discussion uh, is the fact that the most vulnerable and marginalized are not simply the most vulnerable and marginalized by some sort of innate natural phenomenon. Uh, they were not destined to be vulnerable. The position that they find themselves in is one that has been imposed onto them. It is by design. Um, and so the <clears throat> colonial systems and methodologies of exploitation, of extraction, oppression, subjugation, and, and violence, uh, which, you know, uh, over, over de uh, centuries and decades have destroyed indigenous societies, uh, uh, enslaved and murdered millions of people, and entrenched the lasting legacies of inequality, exclusion, uh, poverty, and violence, and, and, and strife are the very same systems and methodologies which have destroyed ecosystems across the global south in pursuit of profit um, and through the extraction of fossil fuels and other natural resources, which have been used historically and up until now to spur the economic and military might of empire. Um, so let's take the DRC here, for example. Um, and Dr. here you Rocky, have... are at time, if maybe you can get into that more during the Q&A. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for grounding us, uh, you know, reminding us of the horrors, of course, that are continually facing the Palestinian people and so many other communities around the, the globe. Um, certainly a lot more to get into in the Q&A. Um, but I want to introduce our third speaker, Ramon Mejia. Uh, Ramon is from Dallas, Texas. At the age of 18, to support his family, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and in 2003 participated in the initial invasion of Iraq. This experience led to self-reflection, converting to Islam, and becoming an outspoken advocate and organizer against U.S. wars and the growing militarization of our communities. Ramon is a member of About Face, Veterans Against the War, and the Anti-Militarism National Organizer for Grassroots Global Justice. Thanks for being here, Ramon. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who's uh, uh, attending and participating in this panel and uh, to the organizers of this event. Uh, to my fellow panelists. Um, 21 years ago, uh, this March, I stood in Northern Kuwait. Um, I looked towards the horizon as the sun melted into the desert. You know, I could still feel the, the warmth of its rays, but also the coldness of that night that it enveloped me. Um, you know, in that moment, I only selfishly thought of myself, of what I would see, what I would do. You know, we were told that our actions were to free the Iraqi people from tyranny, but um, all I saw was the enormous human, social, and economic, and environmental toll that war and occupation brought. You know, the so-called U.S. war on terror has cost the lives of uh, millions of human beings around the world. Men, women, children, entire families evaporated from this earth. Uh, in the years after leaving uh, the Marines, as I sought to process my experience to really come to terms with what I had contributed to and, and attempt to not only bask in uh, in self-pity and remorse, but to truly redress the, the, the wrongs and the harms that I had participated in. Um, I joined uh, About Face Veterans Against the War. You know, at the time it was known uh, as Iraq Veterans Against the War to use my knowledge and experience uh, to expose the truth about these conflicts overseas and the growing militarization of our communities. Uh, here at home. And uh, a few years back, a reporter asked me once, uh, how did you go from being an Iraq war veteran to a climate justice activist? And while I fumbled uh, my answer back then a bit, uh, what is clear is that there are a few activities on earth that are as ecologically destructive as war and militarism. Uh, war comes, uh, Excuse me. When the war comes, uh, severe contamination of water that we drink to quench our, our thirst, uh, soil which sustains us, and the uh, the air that fills our lungs. You know, every sector of society is impacted. Um, in Iraq, I witnessed the, the, the havoc that it has on people in the land, uh, effects that, that people face um, to, to this day. And I'm sorry because it's not my intention to cry, but to 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 raise the seriousness that war and uh, and militarism has on people and in our land, you know. Um, if we are to achieve 
environmental justice, you know, it just transition. You know, we have to confront the, the climate crisis, uh, then, then we must address militarization. Today, uh, we see U.S. politicians and fossil fuel companies and the military itself deploy false solutions in efforts to uh, of greening the military, but an institution that willingly engages in human and ecological destruction to achieve his mission will never be ready to handle climate change. You know, as uh, you know, as as my comrade Zaki was mentioning, you know, the Iraqi, I mean, not the Iraqi, but the as of October seventh, you know, the Israeli occupying forces have killed over twenty three thousand Palestinians. You know, where 59,000 are wounded and maimed, you know, 7,000 more are missing, believed to be dead or under the rubble. You know, a genocide is occurring and it is all our responsibilities to demand of Congress, of Biden to act on a permanent ceasefire now to end all military aid to Israel. Aid, you know, to Israel equals the occupation and killing of Palestinians. You know, if you consider yourself a climate and environmental justice activist, then you must also consider yourself an anti-war and anti-militarist organizer. Um, you know, while workers in the U.S. are struggling to get a, an increase in their minimum wage, while congressional, uh, while Congress continues to fund Israel, just like they did during the Iraq war, it's fattening the pockets of weapons manufacturer executives of shareholders, shareholders that include members of Congress themselves, you know, a permanent ceasefire means uh, not a penny more of our money to aid Israel in genocide and to line the pockets of weapons uh, manufacturers and profiteers. You know, um, in the shadow of the Iraq war, a grassroots global justice alliance was founded by uh, U.S. based grassroots organizations and groups coming together to build uh, a frontline internationalist left alliance of working poor people uh, to, to, to engage in a long term process. Uh, of relationship building and political alignment. And in 2011, we developed, uh, or the organization, the Alliance developed a framework for its members of no war, no warming, build an economy for the people and the planet. This proposal uh, suggested that not only on an international level, but uh, at the national level and at the, at the local level that we were, it was necessary to starve the war machine uh, uh, from its funds to uh, you know to move funds away from the U.S. military towards an economy that 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 allowed life to prosper, right? Um, uh, because we understood that uh, the, the that we needed to define the alternatives to neoliberalism to capitalist imperialism, right? But the experience uh, on the ground of these frontline communities in in, in those years was that. Uh, um, they were facing very real, real issues. Their lights were being shut off. Their water was being shut off. They were being arrested for, or houses were being floor closed on. You know, people's impacts, direct impacts, uh, were needing to be addressed. And while, um, um, as as we start to engage now in this moment, as uh, the divest from harm, the divest from militarism, and the invest in life and care continues to be uh, lifted up. Um, um, it's important that we um, we connect with that, that we uh, we no longer support that our taxpayers go to fund war abroad and at home, that they fund people's needs and 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 not the genocide and not the weapons and not the wars that continues to plague um, all our communities uh, uh, around the world. You know, we need to define look how in this moment we able to relate and what's the entry point for our communities. You know, what is a long term fight that. That, that speaks to this moment of divesting from harm and investing uh, in care. Um, this past October, I was also honored to travel to, to Guahan. Um, 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 it's an island of people that are slowly recovering from typhoon devastation, uh, including power shortages and limited access to water and increasing U.S. militarization of the Pacific region has led uh, organizations uh, um, to, to come together uh, in an attempt to draft the People's Declaration for Peace, Unity, and Climate Justice in the Pacific. You know, they see the, the, the how vital it is for us to address climate change and militarism, that this was the, the, the first time that a unified and formal demands were made uh, in the region against the U.S. military, right? These are indigenous communities that have been harmed for centuries by, uh, of military and colonial occupation, eroding 
cultural practices and self-sufficiency uh, and leaving them vulnerable to climate cat catastrophes. Um, you know, we must radically transform our world. Um, so, so I invite you all to like lift up the slogan of no war, no warming and commit ourselves to divesting from war fueling policies, accelerating uh, the climate destruction and invest in a life affirming regenerative way of living. Uh, let us center peace and justice, accountability and reparations and collective care um, to support real uh, climate solutions uh, because ensuring the survival of people in the land demands it. Uh, thank you. Wow, Ramon, thank you so, so much as always for sharing your story and all of that perspective. Um, I wanna welcome our final speaker, Ash Nicole Lamont, um, who comes from the Ab Absentee Sawney tribe of Oklahoma and the Ogallala uh, and uh, Sikangu Lakota nations. They are a lifelong Oklahoman living on the front line of the climate crisis and fossil fuel extraction. Before joining Honor the Earth as national campaigns director, Ash organized various frontline fights in their community in addition to working with national and international environmental justice and indigenous justice organizations where they supported indigenous led initiatives and fight fights across Turtle Island. Their expertise is the intersection between political economy, environment and race with a keen interest in indigenous, indigenous rights and sovereignty and following the money trail, which we'll hear more about. Um, and they've received numerous awards for their work in Indian country, including the Obama administration's uh, Young Women Empowering Communities and their work has been featured in various documentaries, including Vice's uh, United States of Oil and Gas. Thank you so much for being with us today, Ash. Hi, everyone. We chapi Dewey Machi Yapi. I'm really happy to be here today calling in from Osage Territory in so-called Oklahoma. Um, yeah, and I'm just really, um, really honored to be the last panelist and um, really grateful to follow um, on the trail of my brother Ramon. Um, because a lot of what he was talking about, I'm really going to dive into and really kind of zoom back and really share some of the impacts um, of militarism and colonialism, um, specifically settler colonialism and the impacts um, against Indigenous people. And one thing I think that it's really important, especially in this moment, is really to highlight the importance of Indigenous solidarity with our Palestinian relatives um, because a lot of what they're currently facing is um, parallel to a lot of what our Indigenous communities um, here on Turtle Island have faced and continue to face. Um, what is happening and what we see is really this creation of what we call a false civic identity. And um, that's like, you know, calling itself Israel, um, really trying to do that work of replacing and erasing the actual Indigenous people there, um, erasing their bodies, erasing their histories, erasing their culture and displacing them um, and replacing them with their selves and their false civic identity. And we saw that happen pretty successfully here in the United States. Um, as an absentee Shawnee person, I don't belong in Oklahoma, but my ancestors were forcibly removed and um, relocated from their sacred homelands and the places that we believe that our creator put us on um, to protect and defend and to steward. And I think that that's, you know, a really important point to touch on because we see that happening not only here in Turtle Island and that being our history of um, settler colonialism and the occupation of indigenous people on our own lands by the so-called um, United States of America. Um, but we see that happening globally. And what we really believe here at Honor the Earth is that indigenous people really do represent that last barrier bet between protection of the land and honestly protection of all of our collective futures and all out unfettered resource extraction, um, which we consider you know, to be the new form of um, settler colonialism. And one quote that I really love to just, you know, always highlight is a quote that one of my elders, um, Ponca elder Casey Camp Hornick, um, likes to say is that they used to come at us with their cannons and bayonets, but now they come at us with their pipelines and multinational corporations. And so it's really important, I think, to really tie um, the intersections between colonialism, indigenous sovereignty and indigenous peoples worldwide, militarism, and protection of the environment. Um, because you know, many reports have come out that demonstrate how indigenous people globally 
actually protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And so we truly are that last barrier. And there is also a direct connection between violence to the land and violence to indigenous bodies, um, particularly our women, our young ones, and our two-spirit relatives. Um, and that's why we have, you know, a national campaign for missing and murdered Indigenous women and people. And this is what happened to Berta. This is what's happening in Palestine. This is what happened to Tortuguita at Cop City just last year in so-called Atlanta. Um, this is the violence that we saw at Standing Rock and at Line 3. And so I think that another thing that I really want to draw on is that, you know, this, this connection between violence against Indigenous bodies who are trying to protect and defend the land isn't just happening overseas, it's happening right here in our own backyards. Um, and I'm actually the granddaughter of someone who was murdered by the United States government uh, for protecting the land. And his name is Buddy Lamont and he is Oglala Lakota um, who was murdered at the end of the occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973. And so, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, we've experienced since um, settlers um, arrived on our land, and this is what we're seeing globally and worldwide. And so, um, you know, I want to dive into really quickly, and then I know I'm going to go ahead and um, check after this um, so that we can dive into the, the Q&A. But one of the campaigns that we're really highlighting and trying to um, draw upon is stopping green colonialism. Ramon was talking about false solutions like carbon, um, capture and carbon pricing. Um, but one of the things that we're really wanting to dive into is um, green colonialism, which is, you know, environmental projects that we see neoliberals and right-wingers um, and a lot in the mainstream environmental justice movement, quite frankly, um, putting forth, which is like mining for lithium, um, cobalt, um, copper, um, and other things like that. And um, this is really problematic because um, these are also false solutions to the climate crisis because it involves extraction. And we know that all extraction involves the displacement and the harm of indigenous bodies and indigenous lands. And so this also involves, you know, extraction of natural resources, land grabs, displacement, and imposition of colonial conservation without respecting indigenous knowledge, our needs, our rights, our sovereignty, or free prior and informed consent. Um, but it's, you know, it's being justified because it's considered green energy. Um, you know, these, these minerals are needed for solar panels, they're needed for our phones, they're needed for electric vehicles. Um, but honestly, they're still harming Indigenous people and there is a better way forward. And for a true just transition like Ramon is talking about, we must center Indigenous rights. I mean, we must center Indigenous sovereignty. And this is, you know, not just here, but also in Palestine, Sudan, um, all over the globe. And, you know, it's really our position that um, false solutions, they don't combat the climate crisis. All they do is kick the can of problems down the road for future generations to face. Um, it's our position also that environmental justice, you know, must prioritize land back. And we believe that that's our solution because once indigenous lands are back in indigenous hands, um, we can return to that right relationship with Unchi Maka, our grandmother earth, and really show the way forward and return to stewarding the land like we're supposed to. And so I just want to drop in really quick some examples of, um, of, of green colonialism that's happening right here in so-called Turtle Island. Um, so the Talon Mine is a projected project um, that's going to be mining for nickel, copper, and cobalt that will be impacting the Anishinaabe people of Minnesota. Um, Oak Flat is another one um, that's in so-called Arizona. It's a copper mine um, that the multinational company Rio Tinto, who has an egregious record against Indigenous people worldwide, um, is um, trying to build um, in a place that's sacred to the San Carlos Apache, the Tejano Odom people and others. And then Thacker Pass is a lithium mine um, that the Paiute people in so-called Nevada are fighting. And we're actually seeing the military going in and bulldozing elders' homes and displacing them in real time just happening last year. And he, right here in Oklahoma, um, there's a refinery going to be the first cobalt and nickel refinery in so-called United States called Westwind Elements. And um, that's actually going to be impacting the Apache, Kiowa, Comanche, um, and other communities here in Southwest Oklahoma. And so, you know, we really believe that, you know, these just transitions must center Indigenous voices and leadership, um, must divest from the military, must divest from colonialism, 
um, and really return to that right relationship if we are going to have a future um, for us to fight about. And so I just want to say Niawe and Wopila for having me on this panel, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you so, so much, Ash, um, and much to be said in our Q&A about the need for a just transition that centers not only a transition away from fossil fuels, but also a transition to more just forms of uh, energy extraction and production. So I'm going to move into some questions for our panel today, um, but of course, we'd also love to hear from the audience. So please drop your uh, questions in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, I'm going to pose my first question to Nita, but but panelists, um, you know, feel free to respond to questions that I post to other panelists when I when I call on you as well. Um, so Nita, I, I want to talk about um, your your latest book a bit, um, and, and broadly, you know, how you document that war and mobilization for war have catalyzed deforestation, industrialization, and increasing fossil fuel use in the U.S. and, and elsewhere as well. Why exactly is it that mobilization for militarization tends to increase emissions? What's that relationship between mobilization for war uh, and mobilization for increased fossil fuel usage and extraction? Right, so there's several parts to this, but just think about how uh, military spending and uh, military industrialization are capital intensive. They're re uh, requiring of a kind of economic or industrialization that um, needs a lot of resources. Um, for instance, take an aircraft or a tank made of particular materials, um, you know, uh, aircraft uh, tungsten and molybdenum and other lightweight materials for the military that aren't necessarily required for civilian aircraft. So in other words, military requirements are, are more carbon intensive than civilian requirements. Now, and then um, in terms of deforestation, what we know is that uh, militaries attack, not just the uh, adversary, but they sometimes attack civilians and they attack not just infrastructure, but also the natural, the built, as well as the natural environment as part of the, the strategy of war. So in the United States, the so-called United States in the South during the Civil War, the US military burnt the forests of the um, Confederacy. And this was deliberate and uh, burnt the fields. And um, as a strategy of immiseration, this is part of it. So in general, though, what we see is uh, military spending is correlated with higher emissions. And this uh, is because it has effects across the economy, leading to more use of uh, carbon intensive technologies. I think you're muted. Thanks so much. That's, that's really edifying. Um, and thanks for grounding us in that history a bit. Uh, Zaki, I want to uh, sort of bring it to the present day, um, you know, because just this week, the head of the biggest oil lobby in the U.S., the American Petroleum Institute, told CNN that he thinks that Israel's war in Gaza will threaten energy security by inhibiting the flow of oil out of the region. Talk a little bit about the sort of relationship between the war in Gaza and the climate crisis, and also maybe tell us a bit about what the international climate movement's response has been to that war and, and what it should be. Sure. Um, look, I think I, I've, I've given a, a fair amount of, of information in the beginning, which which I wouldn't repeat, um, <clears throat> in relation to uh, exactly how that uh, the genocidal mission of of Israel and its bombardment and siege on Gaza uh, is has proven completely devastating. Uh, one for the immediate uh, environmental conditions. Um, of Gazans and people across occupied Palestine, uh, but also through the really enormous emissions um, of, of the uh, Israeli occupation forces and of their allies, uh, and specifically uh, the imperialist U.S. military machinery, um, and, and, and how those emissions themselves are really huge, um, and of course, have this you know this this uh, very direct contribution and to the the collapse of our climate. Um, 
I think when it comes to when it comes to the climate justice movement, um, I I am glad and and inspired to see that many in the climate justice movements and across uh, across the globe and specifically those within uh, post colonial contexts um, who have an experience. Uh, with apartheid or with settler colonialism or with dis- di- dispossession um, and, and and violence of these forms um, are coming out in really radical um, shows of solidarity uh, to demand as as a um, to demand as an initial um, uh, need is for a ceasefire of course but going further than that to say well we can arrive at climate justice. Um, without the total liberation uh, of all people from all forms of oppression and exploitation. Um, and, and, you know, we see it in, for example, Fridays for Future, Mina's statement, which which came out um, quite early on when this escalation of, of uh, Israel's assault on Gaza began, uh, where they reminded the climate justice movement that climate justice is a banner under which uh, vulnerable, marginalized and oppressed peoples of the world uh, should rally and unite um, and it's 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 it is not a climate justice uh, differentiates itself from any narrow form of environmentalism, uh, because it is fundamentally about people, and that very word justice uh, centers people uh, within <clears throat> within all of those uh, discussions, demands, deliberations, uh, and etc. Et and so. Um, I, yeah, so I've been inspired to see that, and of course, we'd like to see more of it. We'd we'd, we'd like to see the deepening um, of those intersections and roots um, within the climate justice movement, and more people coming out uh, to to advocate and to wage struggle for the total liberation um, of all oppressed peoples across the globe, and and of course within occupied Palestine. Absolutely. And I'd love to come back to you a little later to to talk a little bit about how um, that sort of international movement of solidarity could extend to other uh, conflicts and other oppressed people across the globe. Um, But first, I'll I'll turn back to Ramon. Um, You mentioned this phrase, starving the war machine, um, divesting from the military, investing uh, in, you know, human flourishing, essentially. But what exactly does that look like? Um, Do we start by, for instance, shrinking the budget? Um, Do we start by closing bases? What does it mean to starve the war machine in practical terms? Yes, thank you. So, I mean, um, action on climate change is going to, you know, it demands that we shutter vast sections of the military machine, if not all of it, right? There are, on one hand, there are over, you know, 790 U.S. military bases across uh, 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 80 plus countries and colonies, uh, U.S. colonies uh, around the world. Um, you know, we we know that the, that the military is a, the largest consumer of fossil fuels and the, and the worst emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, and that makes it an important client of oil and gas corporations. You know, it's no coincidence that these industries continue to back politicians that push for more war, that fund think tanks that push more, you know, a deeper and a greater militarism. Um, so on one hand, it, it's really uh, at confronting the reality uh, that this network, this humongous network uh, of military bases across the world is unsustainable and that, that yes, they need to be shut down. You know, there's uh, beyond the issues, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, related to, to, to sovereignty, these bases are also oftentimes the main source of pollution for, for the communities that they occupy. Um, so that's on one hand, uh, be, but we must not uh, uh, create a binary between the police forces uh, that that are across the world and specifically here in Turtle Island and and the military. You know, it's no coincidences that police budgets around the country mirror that of the U.S. military at the federal level. Um, you know, the 1033 program is a police military nexus of self-dealing uh, uh, to, to legit, legitimize uh, bloated budgets, right? So on one hand, while the military is abroad destroying land and people's lives, the police is here um, uh, d- destroying, you know, the, the, the communities here as well, right? So it, it, it means um, 
our community our communities are inquisitive enough and 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 and, and our visionaries in that we were able to uh identify a new way right a new way of being right um and for the for the moment you know closing uh US military bases um and, and addressing the the increasing police militarization uh here on Turtle Island is something that 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 that, that gets us a start right Absolutely. Um, Ash, I'll, I'll turn to you next, um, because, you know, as you mentioned, fossil fuels, of course, are often obtained via violence so often, uh, but but so often so are components of the green economy. Um, you know, as you mentioned, things like lithium, things like rare earth minerals. So talk a little bit about this term just transition and, and talk about what a transition away from fossil fuels would look like if it does not uh, rely on militarism, rely on increased colonialism, re rely on sort of extractive uh, modes of, of uh, interconnection between people. Yeah, no, I think that that's, you know, a great segue from what um, some of the things that, you know, Ramon and some of the previous um, panelists were touching on. And I, I'm glad that people are bringing up Cop City because I think that that is just like such a very um, important focal point that a lot of people are you know, not really paying attention to, but is definitely a place that is highlighting that, that intersection or that relationship between um, police and the military, um, because it is going to be you know, a place where um, they are training police and military warfare against um, citizens. Um, here who are fighting against, you know, climate crisis and racism and other things like that. And I think that, you know, talking about this just transition, you know, really does, you know, it, it does require us to, you know, face some really tough questions and face some really tough realities. Um, because, you know, as the science, you know, points to, you know, we don't have, we don't have time um, to sit here and, and um, accept piecemeal um, solutions to the climate crisis that you know neoliberals and the mainstream environmental justice movement, i.e., the white um, environmental justice movement and climate justice movement, is trying to um, give us. And um, some of the things that you know we talk about at Honor the Earth and in Indigenous communities um, who are fighting for just transition is the need to really frame things in the terms of colonization and indigeneity. And it really does require this divestment, not only from the military, from capitalism, from colonization, but also from power. It really requires those who have that power um, in these colonial systems, um, who are you know, power wielders, who um, have access to those spaces and have access to different resources to divest from that power and to divest from colonial and to ensure that um, indigenous communities um, Black communities, uh, migrant communities, those who are most impacted and oppressed are the ones who are actually the ones driving forth um, the solutions and, and in charge of the resources um, to make these things happen. And I know that like talking about the just transition and talking about um, specifics is kind of nebulous at this time and point because we haven't seen that happen. Um, we're still fighting the fossil fuel industry and then now we're still fighting, now we're starting to fight um, green colonialism. But some of the visions that we've definitely um, conjured up and really, you know, lean on is this return to the right relationship with um, Mother Earth. And that is, you know, something that we believe Indigenous people all over the globe have the roadmap for, um, because we've been on these lands um, since time immemorial. And we have, you know, creation stories um, that tie us to these lands. And we have ceremonies that re um, affirm that relationship um, that our ancestors um, have and that our future generations will have um, with the lands that we're on and that we protect. And so, you know, we believe that this just transition must first and foremost um, be about land back. And, you know, that isn't pretty. Um, we're seeing that happen in Palestine. You know, we believe wholeheartedly that Palestinian people have the right to return. And that also includes the, them getting their land back. Um, and that means by any means necessary. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we believe that, you know, worldwide that, you know, first and foremost, you know, Indigenous people must have their lands back in their hands. And then after that, you know, we can start talking more about specifics um, because we know that different Indigenous communities have different visions for what um, moving forward looks like, but it definitely won't be um, colonial. It won't have um, this extractive quality to it. 
It won't be something that benefits only a few while harming and leaving behind entire people because that's what you know, EV, that's what electric vehicles do. That's what solar panels do, unfortunately. Um, they do harm Indigenous people worldwide. And so we believe, first and foremost, that solution um, must center land back for Indigenous peoples. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll open it up to all our panelists now. Um, and I want to ask a sort of related question. It's something that all of you have touched on. Uh, but we sometimes hear this refrain that we don't have time to focus on these broader issues like imperialism, like militarism, because the climate crisis is such a major existential threat. Um, we hear, you know, from, from some officials, from some sort of policy wonks, that the answer should be to green military operations to power bases with solar, find carbon-free alternatives to jet fuel. So I'm wondering how you all think through this question of greening military operations, how large a role that should play, and why essentially all of you are saying that that cannot possibly be the only response. Oh, I'll, I'll jump in. What we know is that the uh, military's done a really good job advertising how green they're getting, but it's not actually shown up in terms of a reduction in um, uh, uh, fuel use. And what really reduces fuel use is reduced activities because most of the profile of military emissions is operational, not installations that get solar panels. And um, I don't think we can expect them to lead. You know, there's a saying that Audre Lorde um, has, I think it's the title of an essay, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And, um, you know, so I, I think that we can't expect this institution to, to which has the mission of uh, the US military in particular, but all militaries are first of all defending borders and secondly, projecting power um, in the service of a foreign policy to put greening at the top of their uh, priority list. And I, I think it's extremely inefficient to, to have them be the leaders. Um, but I also think it's really important to address something that Ashley said and Ashley, with all due respect, and I, I mean this, I don't believe it's by any means necessary. I believe um, that democracy and um, deliberation and conversation and negotiation and respect for the other are the route to change. I Again, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And uh, so um, I am disturbed by violence of all kinds everywhere. And I'm really glad people brought up um, the militarization of policing or the militarization that I saw at Standing Rock or that occurred at Line 3 or uh, that is certainly evident uh, at Cop City, the, the militarization of and, and the violence towards activists. I, I don't want to respond in, in kind though. I don't think it's by any means necessary. We'd love to hear from others on the on the panel too, or ask if you have a response as well. Um. Yeah, no, I just think that um, I just want to. I guess you know, with all due respect, you know, I want to go ahead and stand on what I said because you know I, I think that settler colonialism is the violence, and that's the original violence, and so. You know, we can't really say that when Indigenous people or oppressed people or people who are experiencing genocide are responding um, to that or defending their, themselves, their lands, their bodies or their families. I don't think that that's, you know, that we can consider that violence. And exactly what Joy is saying, you know, here in Turtle Island, you know, state violence is the violence. And so that's what we see happening at Cop City. That's what my Lakota relatives, you know, experienced at Standing Rock. That's what my grandpa experienced at Wounded Knee. And so, you know, I'm not saying that I'm advocating for violence. And of course, I also wish that there is a place where democracy or negotiation um, could, you know, solve, you know, such problems. But in the meantime, since that's not the reality, um, I think that it, it, I'm standing in total solidarity with my relatives all across the globe, including in Palestine, who are doing whatever they can to make sure that they defend their lands and that their people can, you know, experience that right of return that all Indigenous people deserve. 
I'm going to start to open it up to audience questions. Um, we're we're hearing from quite a few people who um, are asking where to learn about the other sort of um, you know roots of roots of violence that or root, roots uh, of violence that are sort of taking place in other parts of the world. Um, you know where to learn more about uh, the sort of current um, fights on the front lines of of the climate crisis and colonialism. Um, so I guess I just could have sort of broadly want to ask if folks want to um, talk about any other sort of uh, military operations, wars that are going on around the globe, um, and how the climate justice movement has or has not responded to those. Uh, Zaki, I know that this is something that you started to mention uh, in your. Um, introduction. So, so maybe we could start with you. Um, what what is the sort of response to militariza militarization broadly been from the international climate movement? And are there any specific wars or conflicts that need to be lifted up in that movement? Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, there definitely are. Um, there's conflicts and and wars and uh, imperial powers at work across across the globe that the climate justice movement needs to confront head on. Um, I think, uh, uh, look, I can't necessarily speak uh, for the U.S. context, which I think uh, you know a lot of this discussion is is, is somewhat rooted in. Um, but I know that in my own country, South Africa, which, by the way, is a sub-imperial force on the African continent, um, our SANDF, the South African National Defense Force, our military, uh, is routinely deployed to protect the interests of fossil fuel corporations and of mining capital uh, in other places across the continent. And we see that in the DRC, uh, we see that in, 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 in Mozambique, and it's, you know, so it's it's the military on the one hand, um, and then we also have these, uh, I don't know, paramilitary uh, mercenary private armies uh, you know, private arm, army mercenary groups, uh, which are also deployed to protect these these interests and which play a, a role in then fueling con uh, conflict and the violence um, that is subjected onto, you know, ordinary people and, and, and civilians. Um, I'm also glad that uh, uh, Comrade Ramon spoke to the um, the ways in which the police are, you know, similarly... Uh, responsible and rooted in this, because also in South Africa, I mean, we've seen it with the the Marikana massacre in 2012, um, where the uh, South African police services uh, were deployed to squash a mine workers' strike in Marikana and ended up using live ammunition and 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 brutally murdering and massacring 34 striking mine workers. Um, and so, it I think it just just in this what what it boils down to is the uh, ways in which a bourgeois state, which uh, carries the, well, a state is supposed to carry the mandate of meeting the needs of the people, but a bourgeois state uh, is beholden to the interests of capital. Uh, and in that is incapable of genuinely and truly furthering uh, uh, the liberation of people. It is incapable of furthering a just transition. When we talk about a just transition, we need to talk about ownership. Uh, we cannot, uh, leave it to industry uh, to set the terms and to to lead the just transition, as it were, because there would be nothing just about that. Because industry carries the sole and primary mandate of extracting a profit, um, and and the way in which it does that is through the gross exploitation um, of of workers and the destruction of communities. Um, and so, uh, I suppose I'm muddling different points here. It's my my ADD brain, um, but. Uh, yeah, regardless, I think I think those are important things to look at is is uh, uh, the ways in which those military forces uh, and and uh, the groups which supposedly have legitimate use to violence and force uh, are in fact furthering the interests of of capital as opposed to protecting the uh, well-being of people and planet. Um, but also when we're talking about a just transition, having a key conversation about ownership and, and uh, how resources are managed and who they benefit. I don't know if that answered the question even, Dana, but I hand it back to you. I think it did. Um, I'm curious to hear from others, but I'll just throw out another question that we're getting from, uh, from the audience as well. 
Um, which is a, a couple of people have asked about the role of unions, um, both in the U.S. and abroad, in sort of working to dismantle uh, the global military industrial complex. Um, I'll personally throw out um, a report that came out from Climate and Community and the Transnational Institute late last year, um, which highlighted a number of different examples that could be repeated. Um, you know, for instance, in the 1970s, uh, workers at the U.K.'s Lucas Aerospace uh, a factory um, created a plan when facing cuts to production to shift to producing needed goods like heat pumps and medical equipment. So I think that there are precedents out there. Um, but but curious to hear from the panel, um, you know, on this question of the the role that unions can play, and additionally on our on our previous question about the other conflicts that the that the international environmental justice movement should be looking to. So I, I think there's really good work done by Miriam Pemberton on transition. She's got uh, a book that came out, um, whose name I can't remember, uh, recently on tr just transitions in the United States, several examples. And then there's the work of Heidi Peltier at the Cost of War Project, who looks at how many more jobs you would get if you transitioned away from high levels of military spending. But and, and then I also wanted to get back to the question about other conflicts. If we think about Ukraine, that war um, has, uh, of course, led to uh, the destruction of vast areas of land because of the inundation caused by the by the blowing up of a dam. And then uh, but in addition, it's been calculated by Leonard de Klerk that there was 150 million metric ton CO2 equivalent that we can attribute to the war and the and the uh, subsequent rebuilding and actual rebuilding that's ongoing um, in the last 18 months. So uh, Ukraine is an ongoing conflict that uh, you know has also led to the loss of 110,000 trees as the Russians um, built a highway in Crimea, which they've occupied since 2014. It's a devastating environmental conflict. The, the Russians are also occupying in Ukraine 10 national parks. We'd love to hear from others on the panel as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, unions play an, an important role. We saw, you know, the mass mobilizations of of labor against the war uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and and more recently we've seen um, um, organizer, organizers out of uh, out of the uh, San Francisco and the Bay Area, particularly um, um, the Arab Research and Organizing Center, a member of GEJ, um, engage uh, in a block the boat coalition successfully blockading a, a Zim shipping line that that it's an Israeli uh, shipping line that that transfers not only uh, uh, different kinds of, uh, of of supplies, but also weapons. You know, uh, they built an alliance with the longshore workers of the uh, of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, uh, the local ten, and uh, they honored the community's pickets. And um, you know, they block. They were able to block the boat, uh, um, and and not only block the boat in Oakland, but also coordinate with um, others along the western coast, all the way up to 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 Canada to uh, indigenous communities there that have been fighting the pipelines were also helpful in in wanting to 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 block the boat. So um, I think unions play an important role in in making sure uh, that uh, that the the transferring of not only uh, uh, of military equipment but even uh, human beings, people, soldiers, military personnel to actually go out and wage war. Right, the the, the shipping and the transferring. Uh, of military equipment and human beings is is something that that, that can be stopped and uh, unions are very much vital, uh, especially in our ports. So uh, not only uh, uh, in, uh, on the West Coast but on the East Coast and in the South here in Texas, you know Corpus Christi and Houston are, are some of the largest uh, ports that, that 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 are able to um, uh, uh, ship some you know a lot of this cargo. So um, you know block the boat went down as one of the most significant BDS victories and uh, for Palestine within U.S. history. So um, um, let's continue doing that. Let's continue to collaborate with our uh, with workers and, and the unions in order to uh, stop the shipment of weapons uh, to, to to kill human beings around the world.
We've gotten a couple from a, a couple of different questions from the audience about whether or not there are laws uh, binding the military, uh, similar to laws, um, you know, to that that bind other industries um, that would force reduction in emissions. Um, some have, for instance, asked about what the military's role is in the Paris Climate Agreement, um, which I'll just mention is not um, really law because it's not binding. Um, but I'd love to hear from the panel about the role that military emissions play in those international negotiations, um, because, you know, uh, the military, uh, the U.S. military and, and other militaries have been able to sustain their uh, polluting behaviors for a really long time with little accountability. And we know that no country is actually required to provide data on military emissions uh, in climate talks. So talk a little bit about the role that, militariz that militarization has played um, in these international climate talks and how much talk of war there really is in international climate negotiations. Well, I can start on that. Um... When the United States was uh, thinking about its position at Kyoto in the late 1990s, the Kyoto Protocol was being negotiated. The US military sent a memo to the Clinton administration saying that it wanted military emissions exempted from reporting. The administration essentially agreed with that. The chief negotiator, Stuart Eisenstadt, went to Kyoto and got other countries to go along with the uh, almost total, but there are some exceptions, uh, omission of military emissions reporting. Now, why did they want to keep emissions out of the national country reports? It was because they were concerned that any reporting would lead to a call for reduced fuel use. And the argument in the memo was that even a 10% reduction in fuel use would lead to a decreased ability of the United States to fight and win wars and to dominate the globe militarily. So since then, um, the United States military has not reported its emissions until quite recently. There is a Biden administration law that says uh, there has to be across the board reductions of emissions in the US government. But there is, if you read deeply into the uh, Biden administration, administration um, order on this, executive order, there is an exemption that's possible for national security reasons. So for national security reasons, you don't necessarily have to reduce. And what I've described though, is the United States military leading other countries in omitting reporting of emissions. And uh, at the Dubai meeting and also at, in Glasgow, and uh, there was a move by lots of uh, non-governmental organizations to include military missions in reporting. And um, I think that this may bear fruit. Could I, I just wanted to add on a quickly on that, do we have time? Yeah, let's go to you, Ramon, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with one um, final final question from the audience just to get final thoughts from all of you. Yes, uh, yeah, that would, these international climate conversations, particularly with the COP and the UNFCCC, you know, my, my first experience with the COP process was in Glasgow, in Scotland, um, and, and then uh, um, in, in Egypt as well. Uh, we didn't go to Dubai because we honored the, 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 the BDS, uh, Palestinian BDS call to boycott uh, because of the, the UAE's uh, support uh, of, of, of the Isra Israeli genocide. Um, but what I found was that there is no conversation besides uh, side conversations and side events and in, and, and in civil society that are wanting to 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 have a conversation about the the, the growing military right uh, because uh, what we understand is that there's no serious response to the climate crisis uh, or that no serious response to the climate crisis is compatible uh, with a growing military you know how can we have uh, you know without having the military's impact on people the environment and the climate addressed and mitigated you know how are 
uh, not only us within, you know, here in Turtle Island, but uh, Global South Nations, those most impacted, uh, expected to engage with these international proceedings, you know, meaningfully. Um, you know, no, you know, you know, ex they exclude pointed critique of the military from these conversations um, and are seen as a threat. You know, uh, uh, we uh, organized actions within the blue, blue zone, within the COP process and and pointed that U.S. militarism is the number one polluter, killer, colonizer. And uh, we were uh, reprimanded and said that we couldn't, you know, have critiqued the uh, party member, the United States, right? Um, so these, uh, uh, more than anything, these these international convers, you know, are, are trade shows for continuing to uh, elicit, you know, false solutions. And um, you know, at, not only within Guahan when I attended for the moving of uh, the Making Waves conference, where there, uh, uh, it was an alternative COP space. Is that more and more people are, are, are questioning the validity of the COP process? We have to be there because. You know, power is there, and we have to oppose power at every at every terrain. But we also have to develop alternatives to some of these uh, conferences because they're not going to be the solution for our people. So. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you for such a rich and vibrant discussion. Uh, it was such an honor to get to speak with all of you today. We're hearing a lot of questions from the audience about uh, what next steps should be taken, um, what the sort of big priorities should be for those in the environmental justice movement. Um, and so with that, I'm going to throw it over to uh, Nico from 350 to talk a little bit more about uh, upcoming actions and, and upcoming sort of uh, points points to, to. Thank you, Darna. Um, and first off, thank you um, to our speakers as well. Um, Ashley, Ramon, Nita, Baki, uh, Darna, this was an amazing, amazing panel. And I think you see from all the chat, um, all the amazing responses and the questions that people brought up. Um, thank you to our uh, audience for joining in and for staying over time. We know we are over time. Um, and just want to say one more appreciations to our amazing interpreters, Amber and Hannah, our ASL interpreters, and Andres and Adriana, our Spanish interpreters, and to our incredible MC, Taylor, and all of our staff working behind the scenes. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to do like um, last remarks from everyone, but um, just to let folks know, we will be sending out um, all the links um, that were in the chat as well as um, links from the different speakers and their organizations um, and the recording in the next um, few days. Um, and then one of the things that we want to put in, and we're going to drop it in the chat now, I'm going to ask um, Candice and Mel drop it in the chat. Um, 350 US team has been uh, working with several um, um, 350 leaders and activists around the country in trying to build an international solidarity working group. Um, and to to discuss issues of why internationalism is important, issues of why militarism is important, and these different interconnections. Um, so um, there is a link that um, Taylor just dropped in. Um, and if you click on that link, we'll also send it when we send out the recording. Um, you can get plugged into further um, um, work around internationalism. Um, we will be having a webinar around that in February. So please stay tuned. Um, and with that, I just want to thank everyone again, and um, we will all be in touch. Thank you all. Thank you all so much.